Okay, well, it's five o'clock. We'll go ahead and get started with this webinar. Um, I wanna thank you all for joining. This is Luke Freeman. I am a horticulture specialist with NCAT. Um, NCAT, which is the National Center for Appropriate Technology. We're a national nonprofit and we are hosting this webinar. Our presenter today is Ed Levi, a master beekeeper. And the topic for the webinar today is beekeeping for beginners. To give you a little bit of an introduction to Ed, he began his beekeeping career in France where he graduated from a college beekeeping program. He continued his beekeeping business in Arkansas and became the Arkansas apiary specialist and inspector for the Arkansas State Plant Board. He's also an EAS master beekeeper. He served um, at the plant board for 26 years as the apiary specialist and inspector. During that, he did a lot of association building, lecturing and teaching. He's also done a lot of international work, teaching beekeeping in Asia, Africa and Eastern Europe. Um, and last year, Ed sold his commercial beekeeping business, which included queen breeding, pollination and honey production. Uh, he continues to maintain a few colonies in the Fayetteville area, and uh, currently he's focusing on organizing and running a queen breeding cooperative in Northwest Arkansas, where the goal is to develop queens with high levels of hygienic behavior. So I'd like to um, give the stage to Ed Levi. And as I mentioned to those of you who um, have been with us for the past few minutes, we will be taking questions um, in the chat box. Feel free to ask questions during the workshop. If they're pertinent, I will chime in and ask those to Ed. Otherwise, we will save them for the end and try to get to as many as we can. Um, one more thing to note before um, Ed starts presenting. This uh, webinar is being recorded and we will make it available on YouTube. I will email you all the link afterwards. Um, but just so you know, it is being recorded um, and we will publish that on YouTube. All right, so without further ado, uh, take it away, Ed. Well, thank you, Luke, and thanks everybody for attending. Um, it's a beekeeping workshop. It's a honeybee workshop actually for humans. Uh, uh, I stress that because we don't think the same way bees think. In fact, we don't really know how bees think. And so we're always learning. And I put this picture of this gentleman up. Uh, I took this picture in Slovenia. As Luke said, I've worked all over the world. I've worked in actually five continents, uh, teaching beekeeping and working with beekeepers and building organizations and et cetera. Uh, but this was in Slovenia during a big conference there with 10,000 beekeepers. It's called a Pomondia, and it happens every two years in different parts of the world. The reason I put the picture up there is to remind me that I'm not the expert beekeeper, but I visit a lot of beekeepers from all over the world and a lot in Arkansas and, and all over the United States. I've spoken in, in most states, um, but that has afforded me the ability to learn from a lot of people and learn a lot of different techniques and stuff. And so when I pass on knowledge, I try to remember that it's gentlemen like this that taught me that knowledge. What we're gonna do today is this workshop's gonna have five parts. Uh, the first part is gonna be the importance of bees. The second part's gonna be how bees work. The third part is how beekeepers facilitate bees work. And then, how to get started in beekeeping. And then of course, if possible, we'll have time for some questions and answers. Um, each one of these topics I could spend days on. <laughs> so I'm gonna be really pressed to get through all of my slides. And so I'm gonna have to go pretty fast and I haven't put as many pictures in as I usually like to do because uh, they tend to, get me telling stories. And this, this way I'll be staying on topic and you'll see what I'm saying. And there will be some pictures and some diagrams 
but mostly it's going to be a lot of words and I'm going to have to go fast. So let's get started with the importance of bees. I, Albert Einstein once said, if bees were to disappear, a man would only have a few years to live. And that may or may not true, be true. Um, but I know for sure, and I said after, he, after I heard that he said that, that if we're lucky, we'll be able to survive on gruel, which is basically grains, oats and wheat and, and oatmeal and things like that, because those are the things that don't need pollination. But bees do a lot of pollination. And so when we think about the importance of bees, normally people think about their direct value. Their direct value, of course, is honey. In the United States, and some of these figures are quite old and the prices of honey have gone up and the amount of production has stayed pretty much the same in the US, although uh, the number of bees have gone down to some extent. But more than $250 million worth of honey was produced annually back in the early 2000s. Added to that, there's beeswax and other products that come from bees that have to be considered, and that's another seven and a half million. So we're still looking at a quarter of a billion dollars worth of uh, products made from bees. Their indirect value is something else. Back in 2006, which is quite a while ago, the USDA, with the help of Cornell University, estimated about 18.5 0.6 billion dollars of our agricultural product are as a result of honeybee pollination. This is 50 times more than the value of honey. So when we think of bees and the honey they produce, that's one thing, but they also produce a lot of the food that we eat, a lot of the food that we feed the animals, a lot of the food that supports other animals. Basically, it means that we can thank bees for one out of three bites that we eat. So when you're eating food, you need to be aware that a lot of the food that you're able to eat, the fruit and the nuts and a lot of the vegetables are because of honeybees. And uh, I like to say that it's from cucumbers to ice cream. And one time when I was teaching a class for young school kids, I asked them if there's anything they could think of that bees didn't help make. One of them said ice cream. And I said, well, actually, bees do help make ice cream because they pollinate clover and alfalfa, which feeds cattle who make the milk that makes the ice cream. So bees help in a lot of things. This is a picture of a bee visiting a flower. And as you can see, there's pollen on his back leg, on her back leg. And there's also pollen stuck to the hairs on her body. Pollen has a, a static electric charge to it and bees sort of have the opposite charge. So things stick to them. And when they move from one part of the flower to another part of the flower, some of it falls off. And when they move on to other flowers, it also falls off. So that's what how pollination happens. This is just a picture of a family thanking bees for one out of three bites. Uh, more than that indirect value, that 50 times the value of the honey they produce, we need to think of other, other ways that they add value to our world. So not even figured in those numbers are the advantages that bees give to the general environment and ecology. They clearly enhance the seed, nut, and wild berry production, which feeds much of our wildlife. So those are some of the animals that benefit because of bees. Uh, one of the jobs that I had back several years ago was in Bangladesh. I was invited there to go into the jungle where uh, there was a different species of honeybees, but it was dying out because of the honey hunters that were collecting honey. And um, I went back several years. I worked with 4,500 beekeepers in that or honey hunters in that jungle. And I taught them how they could protect the bees while they collect the honey. So they can continue making money, but they could also continue it for their kids and grandkids. Um, several years later, I went back and the priorities of the jungle 
wardens were were changed. They were into protecting the lions that were there. I mean the tigers. I'm sorry. And it's the Bengal tigers. And uh, there were port poachers there. And they said the bees aren't important anymore. And I had to explain to them that the bees helped feed the wildlife that was there that the, uh, that the tigers lived off of. So if all the bees were not protected, then eventually the tigers would die anyway. So it, it's just part of the ecology and bees are very important for that in all ways. So pollination, we need to talk about what that is. It's the mating of flowers to create offspring seeds in order to continue their species. So flowers need to continue their species, otherwise they won't continue. And to do that, bees come along and other pollinators come along and pollinate and help those seeds become. Um, bees and flowers sort of evolved at the same time. So one cannot live without the other. That's a symbiotic relationship. The tools of pollination are many. There's wind, which is real common for some pollination. For example, corn, the, the male flower is above the female flower and the wind helps knock the pollen off and it falls onto the female flower. And so corn doesn't need insects to help it uh, get pollinated. Another thing is birds. A lot of birds go into flowers for different, uh, for the nectar or for bugs or whatever. And in, in doing that, they will, uh, they will be pollinating. And then insects are extremely important. And of the insects, honeybees are the most efficient for pollination. And the reason they're so efficient is number one, because of their numbers. Their numbers are, are huge. Uh, a good colony of bees can have 60 or even more thousand bees in it, 60,000 bees. So one colony in an area provides a lot of pollination. Whereas other insects, there aren't as many of those around and especially since we've started using a lot of different pesticides and stuff. Another reason that they're, they're uh, very efficient is because bees, unlike most other insects, are specialized. In their organization, they only visit one type of flower at a time. Now there might be two hives visiting different flowers, but one hive is only visiting one flower. So in agriculture, if there's a crop that needs pollination and a colony starts visiting it, it's gonna be moving the pollen from one flower to another flower of the same species. So none of the pollen gets wasted that way. And then lastly, the transportability. Bees can be brought into an area when pollination is necessary and then taken out when the pollination isn't needed anymore after the flowers are done so that the farmers can work without the bees there or if they need to spray something or whatever. So that transport, transportality or transportability uh, is, is important because when a crop needs to be pollinated, thousands of hives can come in. A good example of this, the biggest example in the world of this actually is the almonds in California. Uh, about two thirds of all the bees in the United States go to the almonds for pollination. And without honeybees, the almonds wouldn't have wouldn't be a crop at all, because they flower early in the year when other insects aren't around. The bees come from warm climates, so they come they come in when early in the in the year in February usually, and they pollinate and then they leave. So that transport transportability is very important. This is a picture of some almond trees with some beehives in it. And in that picture, there's five beehives, I believe. And five beehives, you're talking about 300,000 pollinators there. So they can do a lot of work. What happens in, in the relationship with the bee and the flower is the flower makes itself attractive at its time of need. It does that with color, shape, movement with the breeze, 
and with a bartering system. It gives directions to find the pollen. I'm gonna show you a picture of that. And the bees find the attractive flower and enter to reap the bounty of nectar and or pollen. And in doing so, they move the pollen from the male parts of the flower to the female parts of the flower or to other flowers of the same species. So there's that picture of that bee again. There's another picture, it's just a better picture of a bee on a flower, it's collecting pollen. It's probably collecting nectar too, but you can't see that in this picture. But that static electric charge that's on the bee's hair and on the pollen, you can see how it's sticking to the bee. And some of it will fall off onto the female part of the flower, and some of it will move on to the next flower of the same species. This is a picture of a flower that looks different than how it looks when we look at it. This is with an ultraviolet lens. Bees see with ultraviolet light, they see heat. And so they see flowers differently than we do. And the flower is actually giving directions to the bee to say, this is where you're gonna come and get something that you want. And in exchange, you're gonna do some work for me. So that's basically an invitation with directions. This is also an invitation with directions. And we're, we see this all the time, but we don't really think about it. But that's what's happening. They're advertising that they have a food product. product. They're inviting you in. They often have fans blowing the smell out in the, into the street. And they have flags directing you where to go. And in exchange for some money, they're giving you some food. So it's a barter system, just like bees and flowers. This picture is in a whole earth, uh, a whole foods store. And this is what your produce looks like normally with, with bees. The same store in, in trying to educate the world about the importance of bees took out all the, all the fruits and vegetables from this picture and showed what it would look like if we didn't have bees. So some of the citrus didn't need pollination and a few other things but we'd have a lot less to eat if it wasn't for honeybees. This is a picture in China, in an area where they use pesticides so much that they killed all the insects in the area. And so this gentleman is actually pollinating the flowers on this apple tree. And he's, he's, got a, he's collected pollen off of some of the flowers and then he's using a filter of a cigarette to touch the pollen and then touch each flower. Unfortunately, that doesn't really do a good job because when you cut open an apple, how many seeds do you see? There might be nine or 12 or 20 seeds. Each seed needs pollination. So he'd have to come back to each flower as the next seed starts to develop. So in order to, you know, we, now we get apples that sometimes have dents in them or squashes that have a, a wasp waste or tapers off to nothing, like a zucchini that didn't fully develop. That's because the seeds in that area didn't develop. So it was pollinated, but it wasn't completely pollinated. It wasn't pollinated every time a seed was developing. I've done a series of slides here, and these are all from 2006, so they're quite old. They were done from uh, Cornell University with the help of um, the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And they're showing different parts of the country, and I understand that you people are from all different parts of the country and some people from different parts of the world. Um, but so I've tried to re represent some of the major crops in your area. In 2006, California produced $2.2 billion worth of almonds. And almost 90% almost of all the almonds in the world are grown in California. And those almonds cannot make, those almond trees cannot make any almonds without honeybees. So 100% of the, of the product is due to honeybee pollination. So the entire $2.2 billion 
uh, for coming from the almond crop in 2006 were from the bees. Apples, and they're in Washington, New York, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. Of course, they're grown other places, but those are the main places. They're also, at that time, were worth $2.2 billion. And it's figured that 90% of the apples that we eat are because of the pollination of honeybees. So $2 billion again. Blueberries, and they're, they're highlighted in Michigan, New Jersey, Georgia, Oregon, and Maine. And I know that they grow in other places, but those are the main states. Again, 90% of the blueberries. Now, honeybees are not the best pollinators for blueberries. Bumblebees actually do a better job on a one-to-one -one basis, but you can't bring in hundreds of thousands of bumblebees into a, into a field of blueberries at once, but you can with honeybees. Now, some of these crops, like the almonds, for example, that's a seed. Broccoli isn't something that needs pollination except for producing seeds. So this year's crop would be all right without pollination, but we wouldn't have a crop next year. So again, 90% of the broccoli seed is because of pollination from honeybees, which is almost, it's a little bit more than a half a billion dollars in 2006. Carrots are the same thing. The carrots that were grown this year did not need pollination, but the seeds that were grown this year had to have pollination. So some farmers are growing carrots for the seeds and then selling the seeds, and that is worth $577 million. Cherries in Washington and California, and you can see what that's worth. And cotton, and that includes Arkansas, where, where I am. Um, it's not very important to have honeybees for, for cotton, but it's still almost a billion dollars worth, but it's only 16% of the, of the growth of the cotton is due to honeybee pollination. The same is true. Our main crop in Arkansas, where we've got three main crops is cotton, soybeans, and rice. Uh, rice does not need pollination from honeybees. Soybeans benefit from it, not greatly, but enough to make the difference in between farmers staying in business or going out of business. Onions, um, people wouldn't think that bees would pollinate onions and they don't help the actual growth of the fruit, they help the seeds again. And so virtually all of next year's onions come from, from last year's pollination. In the picture of uh, Whole Foods, we didn't see, we saw some oranges left. Well, bees are still responsible for 27% of the oranges that are grown. There's the soybeans that are saying only 7%, only 5%, and they're not showing it being in Arkansas, but it is. So that's all I wanted to do on the, the importance of honeybees. I wanted people to understand that they're extremely important. And when I teach overseas, I, I tell beekeepers because they, a lot of places, and it took me a long time to realize this, don't understand the importance of honeybees for pollination. In fact, in, uh, oops, <laughs> in uh, Nepal, I, I, made several trips to Nepal and it took me until I had been there probably six times teaching beekeepers that they they always laughed when I said, you know, a lot of our beekeepers make money doing pollination instead of making honey. That a lot of the commercial beekeepers make more money on pollination contracts than they do in honey production. And they, people sort of laughed when I said that and I didn't understand why. And it took me six trips to understand that be, uh, farmers in a lot of developing countries think that the bees are actually stealing from them because they're going into their fields with nothing and coming out with, they can see the pollen on their hind legs and they know that they're making honey. So the, the farmers were thinking that the bees were taking things from them and they didn't want bees. Well, slowly but surely, people have started to understand that bees help their crops. And so bees have become more appreciated in developing countries as they have been here. 
here they become more appreciated when we started having problems with bees and the bee populations were declining because of different problems, some of which that we call colony collapse disorder. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the honeybee itself and how it works. In fact, I want to talk quite a bit about that because in order to be a beekeeper, you need to understand how the bee works because the job of the beekeeper is to help it. Just like if you have a cow, you don't just let the cow go out in the field and then you go out and milk it once in a while. You give it food, you make sure it's healthy, you keep it sheltered if you're in a cold location. You make sure that they have forage during the, the, the winter months. And so taking care of animals, animal husbandry, is also true in beekeeping. If you just don't understand bees and you try to keep them, you don't understand how to help them. So in, in talking about this, I need to explain what some of the words are as we go. Because uh, people often ask me how many hives I have. Well, I could, I could say that I had probably a thousand hives, but I never owned a thousand colonies of bees. I had a thousand hives. A hive is a box. A hive is just a cavity that bees live in. It's a house. A colony is a family of bees. It's what, what, how the bees live. The colony works as a unit to promote the continuance of its family and species. Now I'm gonna probably repeat that several times today because the continuance of family and species is what all life does, including us. We work to, con to continue our families and our species. For bees, this requires propagation. And I split propagation into macro and micro propagation. Raising young bees is micropropagation in my mind. So when they have babies, continuing their species by raising young bees. Swarming is macropropagation. Swarming is something that the colony does when it gets too full for its box or when it just wants to separate itself into two colonies, maybe because of risks of being in one location and maybe just another way of continuing its species. We do the same thing. We don't think of it as swarming, but our kids, when they grow up, they move off and they start a family someplace else. They swarm. So, and that's continuing our family and our species. So there's a picture of a bee coming out of the cell that's raising a young bee, that's micropropagation. Different than our kids, that bee's gonna to go to work right away. Uh, some of you, oh, most of you have probably had young, young children at some point or will have young children. You'll find out that they don't go to work right away. But bees go to work as soon as they hatch. They're considered adults. That's a swarm into a bush. So that's, that's the macro propagation. That's a colony of bees, a new colony of bees that has left the hive. Uh, somewhere between 50 and 70% of the bees leave and they go someplace else. In this case, they usually go to a branch or a fence post or something to rest after they've left the hive. And then they send out scouts and those scouts look for a, a good place to live and they decide which scout they're gonna follow and they all go to a good place and they start a new family. So if we guessed what their goal was, we'd have to say that it's genetic survival. And they do that by raising young bees and by swarming. I, I'm putting asks to some of the words and that's to remind me to tell you what swarming is. And I've, I've already done that, but I'll be speaking more about it in a little bit. As an aside from here, I might add that bees don't make honey from, for us any more than cows make honey for the, or make milk for us. They make honey to feed their babies and to continue their species. 
cows don't make milk for us. They make milk to feed their babies. Apples don't make fruit for us. They make the fruit around the seeds to package them in organic material. So as they work their way into the soil, they're already enriched and starting to grow. So the apples that we eat is actually the food that was made for the seeds. And the milk that we drink is food that was made for the, the calves. And the honey that we want to produce, or we do produce, is really honey that was produced to feed their babies and to get themselves through the winter months. They all just want to continue their genetic survival, just like us. So a colony is a family. It has a mother, which is the queen bee, usually just one. It has several fathers that we call drones, the male bees, and it has thousands of sisters, which we call workers. And I'm gonna explain each of those. Here's pictures of the queen, the worker, and the drone. The queen is the largest, the drone is the fastest, uh, fattest. Um, the workers all look the same. Sometimes they'll have variations in color. Um, and different subspecies will have other variations. And I'll talk about that in a bit. The queen, her main job is to lay eggs, but she has some other jobs that she does inadvertently. So let's talk about the queen. There's used one per colony. Now there are exceptions and sometimes beekeepers make the exceptions and sometimes queens make the exception. But having two queens in a colony usually means that there's going to be a fight and one queen's going to beat the other or they're going to quit fighting and one's going to leave. A queen can lay from 1,000 to 2,000 eggs a day. So she's making babies during the season on an ongoing basis, lots of babies. So the season starts in the springtime. Or that's when I think of the season starts. The colony starts growing in the springtime and it, it enlarges and the queen starts laying more and more eggs as the bees bring in more nectar that gets turned into honey and more pollen that gets used to make bee bread to feed the, the, the young bees that are developing. The queen is responsible for the, the colony's identification. And she does that with an odor that we call pheromones. And I'm gonna talk more about pheromones later. But a queen has 21 chemicals in this particular pheromone. And those chemicals are like a recipe. And every queen has a slightly different recipe. So every queen has a different odor that she's putting off. And the bees are all touching the queen and grooming her and feeding her and they're living in a crowded situation. So they all end up smelling like her. And that's what the colony's identification is. Her genetics along with her mates gives the colonies traits. So if you have a queen that has certain traits and she meets with a drone that has the same traits, that's what the traits are gonna be. If she mates with a drone that has different traits, they're gonna be slightly different and some of them are gonna be mixed. But queens mate usually around a dozen times. They mate one time, they fly out of the hive on their mating flight, and they mate with about a dozen different drones. And so she gets a mix of semen and, and sperm, and she stores it, and she only mates that one flight. So she stores all that semen and sperm for all of her life for, for uh, fertilizing eggs but her, her genetics are important and so are those of the drones that mate with her because they identify the abilities and disabilities of the colony. And we'll talk more about that in a bit too. She's cared for by the workers, she's groomed by them, she's fed by them, she can't feed herself. She can survive from five to eight years, but her quality drops with age. 
and it usually starts dropping on about the second year. So beekeepers often will change their queens every few years. The drones are the male bees. They're haploids, which I'll explain. Haploids are mean that they only have one side of the genetics. To complicate things a little bit, it's easy to say that drones don't have fathers, but they do have grandfathers because they have the queen's, their, their mother's father. So they have grandfathers on the female side, but they just have half the genetics themselves. Their main chore is to mate with the queens. And if you look, their eyes are much bigger. So they see the queens flying through the air. They mate in the air. And they go to places that we call drone congregation areas. And queens, when they go to mate, they fly away from their hives so that they're not mating with their sons. And they, that way they keep the genetic pool larger. And the drones are out there waiting for them in, in clusters of drones in the air. And then they, they can see the queens because of those eyes and they chase them and mate with them. They live for an entire season. When I say an entire season, I'm talking about from spring until the next cold season. So from early spring when they start making drones until the fall time. And like the, and I put in there unless, and that unless is unless they're successful in mating with the queen because when they mate with the queen, they die. So the unsuccessful queens at the end of the, the unsuccessful drones, I mean, at the end of the season are not fed because they're cared for also like the queen by the workers. They can't feed themselves. They're fed by the workers. So as winter comes, as the cold season comes, the workers decide that we don't need them anymore. We don't have any virgin queens for them to mate with this time of year. So we don't need to feed them. And as they get weak, they get kicked out of the colony. But they are the other half of the genetics, so they end up being important. And when the next season rolls around, the colony will start making drones again because they know that they'll need them. Because if when they're swarming, they'll have new queens. The workers are the females. They're incomplete females. The queen is a complete female. And I'll explain how that happens a little bit later. They care for the brood nests. They do all the work. That's where they got their name workers. They collect all the resources. They build the comb. They put the nectar into the cells, stock the shelf, so to speak. And they turn that nectar into honey by adding enzymes. And then they take the moisture out of that nectar that becomes honey to get it thicker because the nectar is too watery and they need it to not be watery so that it doesn't ferment and then when when they get it down to where it needs to be they'll close the cells and seal them like big drums on their side so they turn the nectar into honey they care for the queen and the drones they control the colonies they, they control the safety of the colonies if there's an invader or if there's a threat they they protect the colony they control the colony's environment. And I have an asterisk again next to that, so I need to explain that. That environment in the brood area, it needs to be between 92 and 95 degrees at all time when there's brood. Now, you and I know that outside it isn't always between 92 and 95 degrees. Sometimes even in the springtime or in the fall time, it will get down to freezing even, but they still have brood. That brood will die if it gets colder than 92 degrees. So the bees are in there huddling around the brood, vibrating their wings to create heat. Now the opposite happens, and we all know, and especially down here in the southern part of this country, that it can get quite warm. And the hives are sitting out in the sun and the air in the shade is say 100 degrees and the sun is probably 115 
and yet the colony needs to stay between 92 and 95 degrees in the brood area. So the bees, the workers, are directed through communication that they do to go out and collect water. And they collect water and they sprinkle it around in the hive and then the bees in the hive create patterns with their wings and blow that water around and out of the hive. They basically create an air conditioning system to keep the brood in between 92 and 95 degrees Fahrenheit at all times. They all take care of the babies. They feed the babies different food at different times and they feed them often. And so, and I'm gonna explain how that happens in a minute, but they're extremely important because that queen is laying between a thousand and 2000 eggs a day. And so there's babies that need to be fed all the time and, and need to be developed. And then they, then they get older and they overwork and they die at the age of about six weeks old. So a honeybee, if everything goes right, lives to about 42 days old. If things don't go right and they die younger, the colony is going to suffer. The workers' jobs are very organized. Jobs are broken down into categories, mostly dependent on physical development of the bee. But also recently we learned from a researcher in the University of Michigan that they have a, um, the colony's needs also can change the jobs of the bees. And I'm going to explain that physical development. Um, I think I'll do it in a minute. We have to be careful not to, and this word's hard for me to say, anthropomorphize, which means not thinking like people, but we know that we can't think like bees, so we end up thinking like people more than we should. Some things make sense from a bee, uh, from a bee's point, from a human's point of view how bees work. We understand swarming because our kids swarm. We swarmed. We went off and started a family separate from our parents. We understand defensiveness because all of us have some of that in us. We understand collecting food. We understand temperature control, but not in the same way bees do. And we understand hybridization of subspecies which means if you mix subcultures, you get a, a hybrid. Some things we can't understand. And so we learn from the bees. The bees are good teachers if we study them. One of the things that we can't understand from a human uh, perspective is that some things, aren't con some things aren't consistent with our culture. For example, all the females in the hive are taking care of one lady's babies. That doesn't happen in this culture. <laughs> a lot of ladies like to have babies <laughs> and they don't take care of each other's babies. They take care of their own babies. Sometimes, and I can't see my screen all the time. <laughs> Need to get rid of that. Uh, it's good to think of the colony as a biological organism rather than a bunch of individuals. And I'd switch back and forth. Sometimes when I'm working in a colony, I think of it as an organism with a bunch of different cells or different muscle groups that are doing different jobs. And sometimes I think of them as individual bees. The colony works as one in building its homes and finding its resources and making its products in raising and feeding its young and defending against enemies like invaders and diseases in regulating temperatures and in finding new homes in which to swarm. So it's like a biological organism that is working together to do all that. The organization mostly is tasks by age. And we sort of do the same thing too. When our kids are real young, they don't do much. They eat and they sleep and they poop. And that's about all they do. As they get a little bit older, 
you might be able to get them to bring you your slippers or something like that, but they can't carry a bucket of water. As they get older, their muscles develop and they can carry a bucket of water or chop wood or work in the field or whatever. So they develop their tasks by age. Bees do the same thing. We have what we call developmental bees. Those are the youngest bees. The first three days of their life, when they first come out of the cell, they're house cleaners. The first job, the first day, they clean out the cells that bees are hatching out of. And then they go on and they start cleaning other things. There's always a hive, things falling, and they it falls to the bottom of the hive. And if it's a hygienic hive, it will clean it out. It will take those that trash and throw it outside. The second th three days of their life, from the time they're about three to about six, they're able to produce a product that we call royal jelly. Now this is a glandular secretion. It's developed in a gland in their head. And the ones that develop the most of it are those young bees between three and six days old. And that has to be fed to young larvae. The youngest larva gets fed royal jelly. It's very high in protein. The third three days, they start feeding older larvae. So they're feeding larvae that's from five to six days old all the way up to eight days old when the cell is closed. I don't know if you can see, can you see my cursor there? Yeah, those are, yeah, those, those are cells that are closed that have a larva inside that's developing. This is a bee that's already hatching out, but this might have an egg in it that will turn into a larva that will get closed when it has enough food on the eighth day. And on the ninth day, when after it's sealed, will turn into a pupa. And then it will turn into an adult bee. Here's a bee feeding one. So after the first five days of the development of the bee, of the young bee, the food changes from royal jelly to nectar and pollen. It's actually, it's actually called bee bread, which is a fermented mixture of nectar and pollen. Going on age by task, they then become house bees. At about nine days old, they're able to build wax. So different glands, this is in their abdomen, are able to make wax. And they make wax to make the cells, which are perfect little hexagons which is the strongest, strongest uh, shape you can build with the least amount of material. You can't, there's no other shape that even computers can find that you can do with less material that can carry as much weight. At about 12 days old, they start cleaning um, the house again and then guarding and heating and cooling. So the guards are the ones that are gonna protect the hive. They're the ones that are gonna sting most easily. They're the ones that are gonna be heating and cooling the hive depending on ambient temperatures. The next two weeks, they're gonna be converting nectar to honey and store the honey and the pollen. So that's the second third of their life, their house bees. So there's a picture of the underside of a bee that's in between nine and 12 days old that's developing wax in between the scales of its abdomen. Those are guard bees, most likely. It depends which way they're facing. And I don't remember, <laughs> I took this picture years ago. Um, if they're facing out, guard bees often when they feel threatened They'll sort of hunch up like a cat hunches up when it's feeling threatened and look tough to protect the hive. Now, if they're facing the other direction, they're doing the cooling of the hive. They're evaporating that water out of the hive to cool it off. So it's still bees between 12 and 15 days old. When they get a little bit older, they're collecting the honey the nectar that this bee is bringing, actually, this is the older one. This bee is bringing in from the field nectar, passing it off to this bee that's still a house bee 
and that bee's taking it from that bee and adding enzymes to it and then putting it into the cells that bees a little bit younger have made. At about three or four weeks of age, they become field bees or foragers, foraging for nectar, pollen, water, as I explained, and something called propolis. Propolis is a mixture of pollen, honey, and saps from trees and, and plants. And it's mixed and carried in just like pollen, but it looks different and it has a different purpose. The word propolis comes from two words, polis like Acropolis and uh, Annapolis, Minneapolis, that means city. Pro means in favor of or in defense of. So what the word means is the defense of the city. So they're taking, they're taking this glue-like mixture that they've made and they're using it to seal cracks in their hive, to coat things, to close off the entrance if it's getting cold to, so that there's not so much air coming in. And then it's also a natural antibiotic that both people and bees use. A uh, researcher in Minneapolis um, has done a bunch of research on this and she found out that bees that have a lot of propolis in their hive don't have to work as hard in order to fight off diseases because they have this natural antibiotic. So there's their foragers. That's what you see out in the field are the older bees. And they're gonna work hard for two or three weeks and then they're gonna die from overworking. The brood development is what's going on in the cells. And the egg is, the egg is being laid by the queen, one egg, if the queen's good, she's laying one egg in the back wall of each cell. And she's going along and she's measuring the cell with her antenna. And she's deciding whether that cell is the size for a worker or for a drone, because the drones are larger. So when she decides it's for a worker, when she's pushing the egg down her tubes to be laid, she adds to it some semen from a drone and it becomes a female egg. If she wants it to be a drone, if the cell is larger, she's not gonna put any semen with it because it's a haploid, it only has her genetics. It doesn't have the genetics of a drone. So as far as we know, honeybees are the only ones and I'm not sure about ants, that, that the queen is actually able to decide whether she's gonna fertilize an egg or not. So the egg is an egg for three days. The queen, the mated queen lays an egg in each cell. The fertilized eggs are female, the unfertilized eggs are drones or haploids. The egg is fed royal jelly, which I explained to you what it was, and it hatches into a larva on the third day. So these are larvae. This is royal jelly around the larva. There's the larva. There's a smaller larva. That's even a younger one. That's, that one's just hatched. The larva will double in size every day if they're fed well. They'll be fed the royal jelly for five days, five days from the time the egg was laid. On the fifth day, the diet changes. I don't know if I explain this again later, so I'm gonna explain it now. On the fifth day, the diet changes and they're fed the, the bee bread, the mixture of pollen and honey. When that diet changes, that stops the development of the reproductive system in the females. And so they become incomplete females when they're fed that. If they're wanting to make a queen, they can take any egg or young larva and just keep feeding that royal jelly. And then its uh, reproductive system will develop fully and it will become a queen. So there's a picture of the worker development. There's the egg, young larva, older larva, oldest larva, and there it's starting to stretch out to be a pupa. So this is a pupa and then it's an adult bee. This whole process takes 21 days for, for the Western honeybee. Now, I know that we have at least a few people 
on this uh, webinar in Africa, your bees develop in 18 days, which is gives some advantages that I don't think we're going to be able to get into right now. But our bees, the Western honeybees, which were imported, by the way, to the Americas, they're not native to the Americas, develop in 21 days. The females do. Now, the queen is fed royal jelly. So she develops in 16 days because she's got a lot more protein. The males are fed the same as the workers, but they take 24 days to develop. So the diet is changed to pollen and nectar on the fifth day. This stops the development of the reproductive system. The larva is fed and sealed on the ninth day. The larva pupates on the 12th day. So I told you wrong a minute ago. On the 21st day, an adult worker bee emerges. So this is a beekeeper looking at a frame. That's, that's what some people call racks. We call them frames. There's usually 10 frames in a hive, in our hives, modern hives. Um, this frame is from a second box, and I can tell that because of the shape of the brood. This, this is brood here. This thin line in between the brood and the honey, that's all pollen. They put pollen near the brood because they want it easy to ex access to feed the brood. This is sealed honey, so it's already gotten the extra moisture out of it and could be harvested, except there's too much brood there, you wouldn't want to harvest it. The queen development is fed in the, the queen when it's developing is fed only royal jelly. Its cell looks different. It looks like a peanut cell uh, protruding from the frame and it develops in 16 days. This one is just hatched because the door or the, the capping is still attached, almost like a trapdoor spider. The drone is an unfertilized egg laid in a drone sized cell and matures in 24 days. So there's pictures of the drones that are hatching out. Foraging. This is what we think bees do, but they do a lot of things as you've just learned inside the hive. After the first three weeks, three to four weeks of life, the worker bee takes flight and becomes a field bee. Now they need to learn their way around. So when they first learn to fly, they go outside and they fly circles around the hive and they learn the environment and they learn where their hive is. And if there's another hive right next door, they don't want to go into that one because they smell differently because of the queen. But they go out to the field and they come back and they, they they have found honey and they bring it back in or pollen or propolis or water. Now, in order to find it and to all be getting the same flower, the same nectar, they have scouts. The scouts go out and they find the food and then they come back and they communicate to the others what the food is and where it is. And if you can imagine that you couldn't talk and you couldn't point and you couldn't write and you went someplace and you came back with some food and people wanted to know what you got and where you got it, it'd be hard to do. But they're able to do it through dance and smell. So they collect pollen, nectar, propolis, and water. They overwork and die at the age of six weeks if they're lucky. They need to communicate. Uh, they communicate the identity of the colony, the needs of the colony, the dangers to the colony, the location of, and the location of resources. They communicate a bunch of other things. For example, the queen on her feet has little glands that also produce pheromones. And so when she's walking around on the, on, on the cells, she's leaving a trail showing the young bees where she's walked so that they'll know where she's laid eggs and in what order she laid the eggs so that they're fed at the right time. Ants do the same thing. If you see ants, they're often walking in straight lines. If it starts raining or you scatter water on them, they scatter and they can't figure out what they're doing because the pheromones are based. 
So how do bees communicate? We know that they use pheromones and that's a smell. Now to explain pheromones, pheromones are an odor that is put out by one individual to direct another individual to do something. Sort of the opposite of, of hor hormones, which we've all experienced. Hormones are glands that produce things in our body that tell our body to do things. This is glands that produce things in our body that tells other beings to do something. They also use dance. And dance is important. It's not as important as pheromones. The reason I like to think about pheromones is that people use a lot of chemicals in and around their hive or essential oils in or around their hive and, and maybe even a smoker, which we'll talk about in a little while, too much. And, they're, and it's the same as sprinkling water on ants. You're covering up the pheromones. You're making communication difficult. It's like I was talking and all of a sudden a, a big jet flew overhead just above my house. You wouldn't be able to hear me. So that's why I'm, I'm interested in pheromones and that's why people need to understand pheromones if they wanna be beekeepers. The dance is also important and we're lucky enough to be able to see the dance and figure out what they're doing. This is a picture of pheromones being collected basically. That's a queen in the middle and a bunch of bees, an entourage of bees that are grooming her, touching her with their antennae, which is their smelling device, basically their noses and picking up her pheromone and then walking around the hive and all the other bees touch them and they pick it up too. This is a bee that's come back from the field and it's got pollen on its hind legs and it's probably got nectar too. And there's bees smelling it to find out what it got. And she's doing a dance and she's doing the dance to tell the bees what direction she found this flower and what the flower has by smell and how far it is. And I'll explain that. That's the dance going on. You know, it looks like that sort of, <laughs> not really. <laughs> the dance that they're doing for this particular thing is called a wagtail dance. It's basically a figure eight with intermediate movements through the middle of the figure. So the queen here is walking in circles and then she's wagging her tail going through the center and then walking around and wagging her tail going through the center. Now, remember that she's doing this on the comb that's hanging in the frame. So it's a vertical surface that she's doing the stance on and the bees are watching her and even copying her to memorize the dance. When she goes through the center of there, she's telling the distance by how intensely she's wagging her tail. And she's actually not you know, until, until relatively recently, we thought she was literally telling distance, but actually what she's doing is she's telling them how much food you need to have to get to where you're going. Sort of like if you were gonna get in a big jet and you were flying from, I don't know, Atlanta to Chicago, you need to put in a half a tank of fuel because it's not real far. But if you're flying from Atlanta to Lagos, Nigeria, you're gonna need a full tank of fuel. Now, if you put in a full tank of fuel, you're wasting energy to fly it to Chicago. If you don't put in a full tank going to Lagos, Nigeria, you're gonna not make it. So she's actually telling the bees how much fuel they need in order to get to where they're going. So that's how they're figuring the distance. The direction is by the direction of this passage through the center. So I'll show you some illustrations of that. In this first section here, the hive is here, the flower is there and the sun is there. So she's doing the dance directly upward because she's on a vertical plane. She's doing the dance upward, saying that the flower is in the direction of the sun. So if the sun is, say, at 2 o'clock, the flower is also at 2 o'clock. 
from where you're standing. If the flower is off to the right, she's going to do her dance slightly off to the right, the same number of degrees. If the flower is the opposite direction of the sun, she'll do the dance downward and so forth. Now, you wonder what's going to happen on a cloudy day. Well, number one, I told you that bees see ultraviolet light, so they see the heat of the sun, but they, bees have five eyes. And their two big eyes that we see easily are multifaceted. So they see light in spectrums and they see movement also in spectrums. So they are, they're able to tell at all times, except the middle of the night, where the sun is, even if it's totally cloudy outside. So towards the sun, away from the sun, and 110 degrees right of the sun. So that's how they're communicating where the source is. They're communicating the source by smell. Pheromones are the main way that bees communicate. It's a, a chemical release externally by one bee which stimulates the response from others. Queen substance is one of them. That's that picture. Well, this is a different picture, but it's the same thing of a queen in the center and the other bees picking up her, her substance, her, her main pheromone. You notice the red mark on that queen. That's telling, that's the beekeeper that put that mark on the queen to tell what year that queen was developed so we know how old she is. Uh, the queen also controls the behavior of the colony, uh, rearing and replacement of queens, controlling swarming. If she's producing a lot of pheromone, they won't swarm as easily, and stimulating brood production. She's also brood rearing. She's also attracting drones with her smell and identifying the colony with their smell. So there's the dancing bee. There's a queen actually in the middle there. Those are the queen cells that are about to hatch. There's a swarm in a tree. The second part of pheromones are the worker pheromones. They have an orientation scent that they put out when a swarm lands someplace and goes into a cavity, whether it's a hive or a hollow tree or whatever, there will be bees. If the queen is in there, there will be bees on the outside pushing the air out to put a plume of, of odor of the queen out into the air so the rest of the swarm can find where they've gone. This bee is exposing a pheromone that we'll talk about next. It's the alarm pheromone. When a bee stings somebody, or if a bee senses a danger, it will expose that pheromone, that gland, in order to tell the other bees that there's a danger. So it's not just that bee that's going to try to protect the colony, but other bees are going to be notified that there's an emergency and we need to do something. When it stings somebody, it will tag that person with a pheromone. And so if you were to get stung one time, if you cover up the odor of that sting real fast with a smoker, for example, you won't get stung at least in that same place right away. Uh, the smoker, and I was gonna explain that later, but I'll explain it now. Its main purpose is to calm the bees. And I use a smoker very little because it's covering up pheromones but if I'm aware that the bees are starting to become alarmed because of my presence, I'll give a little puff in the hive to cover up the odor of that pheromone. They also have a mandibular gland, the sting gland, which is like the alarm gland. There's a sting in somebody. Um, next to it, you can see some, above it, you can see some juice, that's probably honey but she's tagged that person with a pheromone. And if you get the stinger out fast, it doesn't hurt very much, but if you take it out by pinching it and then pulling it out, it's like a syringe. You're pushing all the venom into you when you pinch it. So it's best to scrape it out with a credit card or a hive tool or a smoker tip or something. If you scrape it out, 
I always use a, a smoker when I when I have it at handy uh, because that covers up the pheromone and takes the stinger out without squeezing. The trail pheromone I talked to you about, the brood pheromone, the brood itself, the larvae are giving pheromones. It's like babies crying when they're hungry. We don't hear them because they don't make a noise, but the, the bees can smell it and they know that it's time to feed that one because it's putting out that pheromone. And there's lots of other ones. Swarming is a natural thing. What happens is the queen reduces egg laying. She's uh, losing weight because the bees force her to exercise. The workers reduce activity and increase honey stomach content. The bees emerge usually between 10 and 12 in the after, 10 in the morning and 12 in the afternoon on nice days. And the division is random, but there'll be more older bees that leave than younger ones. So somewhere between 50 and 75% of the parent hive of the original colony is gonna leave and go find a place to rest in a tree and then go find a permanent place. Again, the scouts are gonna leave. Even before they leave the hive, they start looking for a permanent place. But when they land in a tree, then scouts will go out and they'll look for a good place to live. And scouts will come back to the, to the swarm that's hanging on the tree. And on the outside of the swarm, they'll start dancing. And you can see that dance that I just explained. And if you see it and, it, and they're dancing all different directions, they haven't decided where to go yet. They're sort of competing by saying, you know, I found this place and it's really cool. And the next bee is dancing even more energetically, which means it's more cool. And, and they're sort of debating where to go. When they all start pointing in the same direction, then they're getting ready to go. And when some of them are pointing in the same direction, but a few of them are not, they're pointing in a different direction some of the bees will go over and actually break up that dance so that they come to a consensus faster. So it's sort of like the way our government's supposed to work. <laughs> uh, so they cluster nearby, that's the swarm, until scouts find a new home and then they move in mass. It's a division of a social unit. It's swarm like our kids do or we did. To do all this, bees need food. Mostly they need honey and pollen to make young bees, but also to nourish themselves. And I should say here that bees eat very little. They can basically fly around the world with the energy of one drop of honey. Uh, they do need honey in the winter time and I'll talk about that later. They have to have some energy to work, for example, going to flowers. They make beeswax. They need to take in food in order to produce the beeswax, which again is a glandular secretion. They have to have food to survive the winter and to start the next season. Nectar is from plants with the work of bees makes honey. And that's the bees carbohydrates. That's like sugar to them. Pollen is also from plants and it provides their proteins. The mix of the two is fermented to make the bee bread that I spoke about earlier, which is to feed the young brood. And the royal jelly is a gland produced by young bees to feed the developing queens and young brood. So the foragers fly from flower to flower collecting pollen and nectar. Their purpose is to provide nourishment to raise their young and to build their nurseries and to build and fill their storage pantries. In doing so, they inadvertently move pollen within and between flowers. So they're doing the pollination. And they all do this while doing no damage except out of defense. Now, I personally cannot think of another animal that doesn't damage plants, actually helps plants, doesn't damage any other animals, except in defensiveness, except honeybees. 
After describing their importance in the biology of honeybees, it seems mandatory to explain that bees are in peril. Bees are attacked by lots of different problems. They're attacked by reduced foraging. For example, urban sprawl has wiped out a lot of, uh, a lot of flowers that bees could be using. Some agriculture, um, well, let me get to that. Increased pollination and pesticides is, a, is something that they're threatened by. Invasions of new and de devastating parasites and maladies, diseases, and climate change. Those are all problems that are hurting bees. Now that foraging, I started to explain that part of the reduced foraging is urban sprawl, but part of it is the type of agriculture that's being done on huge monoculture basis where farms have become instead of little family farms that have various crops and have hedgerows around them and etc they become massive fields where everything is killed except for what they want to have growing and that leaves bees with very little to eat even if the crop that's growing produces honey and, and pollen that doesn't mean that it's good for the bees in the long run because they're only getting one type of pollen and one type of honey. It's better to have a mixed diet. It's like if we all ate yogurt, yogurt's good for us, but just eating yogurt wouldn't be very good for us. So citizens and beekeepers have to try to minimize those dangers. So beekeeping, is the next thing we need to talk about. And it looks like we've got a little bit of time. Bees can do this without our help. They don't need us to do this. But if we act as their guardians, they can do even better. We can provide them with a place to live, a location with resources, sur surplus carbohydrates or proteins if they run low, and help them fight invaders and diseases and other problems that they might encounter. As guardians, we work for their best interests by helping them do what they do. And that's exactly why it's important that I gave you the biology of the bees before we got to beekeeping. Like dairy people, apples, and et cetera, we have to learn how to encourage increased production beyond the needs of the subjects of our, our work. So if we wanna produce honey, we have to learn how to help the bees make more than what they need. If we wanna produce milk, we don't want the cows just to produce enough to feed their babies, we want them to produce more and so forth. Beekeeping is insect husbandry. It's a craft with its basis that should be strongly based in science. So beekeepers have different opinions about things, but all of it should be based in understanding bees the best we can. We encourage increased production and good beekeepers harvest only the surplus honey, that which is beyond the needs of the colony. If we take too much honey from the bees when they're going into winter, they won't have enough to get through winter and start the next season. So it's not, it's counterproductive. I saw a sign one time, it was a Chinese proverb that says a frog does not drink all the water in its pond. So as their guardians, we must understand their biology, their needs, and their problems. Then we can help them be. People are beekeepers because it's interesting, because they want to reap honey, and, and or they want their, their pollination needs met. For any of those reasons, the beekeeper needs to encourage the well-being of their colonies by helping them through problems and encouraging brew production prior to pollination needs or nectar flows. Nectar flows is when there's a lot of flowers in there. And the reason we encourage their brood production prior is that what bees would naturally do would be to produce a lot of bees during a nectar flow. That isn't productive for us because they're gonna feed a lot of that nectar that they're bringing in into the, the young bees. We want to produce a lot of bees that will be old enough 
when the flowers are ready to produce a lot of nectars. So what we need to do is we need to encourage bee brood production about six or seven weeks prior to the time that there's gonna be a lot of nectar available for them. And we do that through different means of stimulation. You always have to make choices. You guys had to choose whether to attend this class or not. Uh, you had to make choices of whether you were gonna eat dinner before or after. You had to decide what time you had to be home in order to do it. We make choices based on perceived outcomes or consequences and we're constantly making choices. And this is a, just my favorite picture of making choices. I was in Bangkok and out in a little boat on a river and this lady came up to me and made me make a choice in between Coke and beer. I chose the Coke. <laughs> Beekeeping is full of choices. To check them, to make splits, to move them, to feed them, to replace combs, to replace queens, to move frames, how much honey to take, et cetera, et cetera. There's just choices all the time. And then there's how to deal with ailments, how to take care of diseases. Do we treat them regularly by the calendar or do we measure and treat by thresholds? Do we take risks? Do we plan for the future? Those, there's just choices to be made all the time and, and that comes with experience and with learning from other people. Not like those caring for animals, not unlike those caring for animals and farm crops or trees. Beekeepers need to consider traits, characteristics of the bee genetics they raise. In other words, for example, there's bees that are better at developing their colony fast in the spring, but then they might wear out. Like a quarter horse will be real fast out of the gate, but it will tire shortly thereafter. That's how it got the name quarter horse, by the way. For the first quarter mile, it was fast. Some are like breeds of cattle, which are better at producing milk while others are better at producing meat. Chickens are the same thing. You know, big meat chickens are not as good at producing eggs. They're putting their energy into producing meat. Some breeds of crops will produce better in northern climates while others will do better in warmer or shorter climates or with shorter dark season, winter season. There are species and subspecies of honeybees that have various characteristics. Some are better at surviving long and cold winters. Some are better at com combating parasitic threats. Some are more defensive than others. And some are, are better at hoarding stars of honey. So now you've decided your purpose. If you want to become a beekeeping, you have to proceed. The actual jobs beekeepers need to visit or what I call inspect their colonies to see how they're doing and what they can do to facilitate their well-being. Do they need feeding and what kind? Do they need more or less room and how? Do they have maladies or diseases or parasites and what can you do about it? Are they going to swarm? Should they be divided or combined? There's decisions all the time. And making those decisions depends on what you want to do as a beekeeper. They might need a new queen. Some of the things that beekeepers should be considering, I can't address them all. And we're going to talk about questions in a little bit. Uh, conditions vary in every hive and with locations. And I stress that thing about locations when you, if you give me a question, I need to know where you are in order to be able to guess at the answer. I moved about three hours from where I used to live to where I live now and beekeeping's different here. So if I moved from Arkansas to Michigan, beekeeping would be very different. Or if I was beekeeping in Nigeria or Senegal, it's very different again. That is to say that more than one right answer, there's more than one right answer and it can depend on local conditions and the beekeeper's goals. So that's your first decision to decide what you want out of beekeeping. My experience, conditions and philosophies taint my responses. 
So I don't necessarily have the right answers. I have answers that I've learned from other people and, and then I mix them with my goals and my philosophies. In full disclosure, I have strong beliefs in science, but also in the non-use of chemicals in or around the beehives. And that's not true for all beekeepers. Some beekeepers, I've worked with beekeepers that don't understand the science of bees at all. And I've worked with beekeepers that throw chemicals at bees constantly. On that last point, I believe in integrated pest management in beekeeping. This involves knowing the problem, measuring the intensity of the problem and, and at what threshold it becomes harmful, having a full array of to tools to combat the problem, applying the least intrusive invasive tool that's appropriate for the intensity of the problem and remeasuring to know if the treatment was successful. That's basically the rules of integrated pest management but it's also the rules for bees. Bees are attacked by bunches of different things. Viruses, bacteria, funguses and yeasts, uh, tracheal mites, varroa mites. Those are two parasites, three parasites, small hive beetle that have been devastating to the bees in the last few years. They've come from different areas. The small hive beetle came from the southern part of Africa. The varroa mites came from the Asian bee and transferred onto the western bee. The tracheal mites came from an island off the coast of England. And then we also have pollutants that we use and breathe. So this is harmful to bees. All these things are harmful to bees and the beekeeper needs to be aware of those and understand what those problems look like and what tools we have available to combat them. Uh, Penn State University came up with what looks like a food pyramid, but it's actually an IPM for pests and animals and humans. Um, being like with a food pyramid, you have at the bottom what you should do most, cultural, uh, prevention, basically. If you go up the chart, I keep wanting the point. If you go up the chart, prevention is at the base and the intervention is at the top. And the, the bottom is least toxic and the top is most toxic. So you have cultural means, you have physical and mechanical means, and you have biological means. I use all three of those. And depending on the problem and the, and the intensity of the problem, that's what I use. I haven't gone to chemicals in the last 20 years. I've been keeping bees for 48 years, but in 20 years, I haven't used chemicals. And that's when chemicals started being really popular. Um, there are different types of chemicals. There's pesticides that kill on contact. There's repellents. There's some chemical, the diatomaceous earth, I don't really call a chemical. That's more of a mechanical control. Oils, sort of the same, but there's chemicals that are less harmful than other chemicals. There's biological means, which means uh, predators that you can use to kill parasites. For example, there's, a, there's two different types of, generally there's two different types of nematodes. I use a nematode that doesn't hurt plants, but hurts bugs in the ground. The small hive beetle goes into the ground to pupate there's two different varieties of nematodes that will eat the pupils of the small hive beetle. So they never become adults. On the physical and mechanical, there's lots of different things you can do. Um, different types of combs, screen bottom boards, uh, different things like that. On cultural, that's my main focus right now because that's the way I'm gonna get the bees to be able to take care of themselves. And I do that by raising I looked at time by raising bees that are able to combat the parasites. Really quickly, honey is only damaged by the how we handle it from the flowers to the market. So if we put pesticides and herbicides in the fields, 
we're going to have pesticides and herbicides and everything. If we are harmful to the honey when we're processing it, or we take it off too soon, or we use chemicals in our uh, production and our processing, we're going to damage it. We should honor the work of the flowers and the bees and produce a perfect product. This is a picture I got for when I was working for the state plant board. I called this my sucking up picture. <laughs> 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 um, this is just, to me, this is beautiful. These bees have made this perfect comb. They're filling up with fresh nectar that's just coming from the field. And it's just a beautiful product. We need to take care of it. Getting started in beekeeping is a decision. And I don't, I don't know what to do here because we've got a little bit more to go and we're at time. Do you have a suggestion, Luke? How many more slides do you have left, Ed? Uh, we're at slide 72 and I go to 89. I can go through them kind of fast. Yeah, would there be a way for you to wrap up quickly in the next five to 10 minutes? And I can if people try. want to stay on for that, they can? I can try. Okay. Yeah, everyone's saying to keep going. <laughs> so okay. They want okay. you to keep going. <laughs> okay, yeah. your next decision, if you're going to be a beekeeper, is what you want from it, uh, what your purpose is. Backyard bee beekeepers might want it for personal pleasure, honey, or pollination, or making, or commercial beekeepers want to make money, sell honey, pollination contracts, selling bees, queens, or equipment, or other possibilities. Then you must decide what level of beekeeping you want. You can be just an easygoing beekeeper that just enjoys watching the bees and taking care of them a little, or you can get into it on a scientific level, uh, making equipment uh, as a carpenter or raising queens. Um, there's just lots and lots of levels of beekeeping. I suggest that all of you, and most of you will have this nearby, join a beekeeper association and an apprentice with a mentor, because that's the only way you can really learn to get started with bees. The bees are a good teacher, but you can read books and learn from books, but a mentor and a beekeeper association is excellent. You're gonna find a bunch of opinions in beekeeper associations, uh, but you will learn and, you, and there will be beekeepers will take you under their wing. They will likely have extra equipment they will help you to catch a swarm or maybe give you a nuke, which I'll explain a nuke in a minute. Though uh, some cautions in getting a mentor, be careful of bad habits. Everybody's got some bad habits and they're hard to break. Um, always refer to science in making decisions. There's lots of resources out there. There's books, journals, online publications, uh, the extension service and the departments of eggs all have information available, uh, libraries and, and online and borrowing books, et cetera. There's lots of opinions and the styles out there. How often to requeen, one or two hive bodies, how to feed or harvest, when, what, and how. Queen excluder or honey excluder. Queen excluder, I'll explain in just a second mitigation of diseases and parasites, et cetera, et cetera. For my purposes, I requeen every year, but that's because I'm working on genetics. Uh, very few beekeepers do that. Several will requeen every other year. For my locations and for honey production, I use one high body and a queen excluder and medium supers. I minimize artificial feeding, but I use artificial feeding when I'm raising queens. I watch for and mitigate uh, diseases, parasites using IPM, mainly with cultural, mechanical, and biological means. On that point up here about artificial feeding, um, I leave enough honey for them to get through the winter. And where I live, they could probably get through, depending on the breed of bees that I'm using, they can probably get through with 30 pounds. I usually leave 50 pounds. Um, 
farther north, you'll have to leave more beekeeping equipment. This beekeeping, beekeeper doesn't look very enthusiastic, but he's got all the things there. He's got the hive, which is there. It's two hive bodies and a super. He's got a hive tool in his hand there. He's got a smoker, which I told you is to keep the bees calm and to cover up their alarm pheromone. He's got a veil. By the way, those first three things I always use. He's got a veil, which I rarely use. He's got a bee suit that I rarely use. He's got a brush that I use once in a while with raising queens, and he doesn't have gloves. But those are things that a beekeeper might want to have. This is a modern hive. Now, there's lots of different types of hives, but this is what's used mainly in the United States. You've got the top board, the inner cover, the medium supers. Supers are anything above the brood chamber that comes from superimpose or superstructure or above. Queen excluder is something that stops the queen from going up into the supers. So the queen is kept into the brood chambers. Frames are hanging in there and they have foundation or comb in them. Uh, the hive bodies is where the brood is developed, bottom board, and then some sort of a hive stand. There's other types of hives and top bar hives have become very important in this country recently. It's a fad. I don't really advise using uh, top bar hive body, uh, top bar hives. They're they're good for their purpose, but they were developed in Kenya. There's nothing wrong with Kenya, but in Kenya, the bees that they have and conditions that they have warrant having top bar hives. Uh, they're easier to make. Um, if you buy one, they're actually more expensive here. Uh, I've made a lot in Africa. Traditional hives are basically what's used in, in developing countries where they don't have the wood and they use straw or sticks or, or uh, whatever containers they can find. Ours are a, model, a modern hive. Ours are called a land straw. And somebody asked me about the flow hives. Flow hives are a very expensive hive that's made for people to have bees, which I call bee hackers, as opposed to bee keepers. Flow hives, you can extract the honey out of the hive without ever opening the hive, which means you're not gonna open the hive very much anyway. And therefore you're not gonna know where you can help. I think that flow hives are dangerous for bees personally. All these different hives have pros and cons and places and purposes. Where to get equipment, you can have it given to you, new or used. And I wanna talk about used equipment a little bit because somebody asked me, used equipment is empty because something happened to the bees. Now, before we had mites, which came in the 1980s, uh, we had a main disease that was called American fowl brood, which is super contagious. It can live without a host for decades. So if you are given used equipment, you should scorch out the inside really well, scrape it and scorch it. You should probably just burn the frames and get new frames. I would not use a used hive without really cleaning it well. Uh, you can buy stuff new or used. And again, there's the used, be careful. Uh, new, you can buy them online or even through your lumber store, but those are usually more expensive. There's about five companies in the US that sell new equipment. You can get it locally, commercial or not. You can also get a carpenter and make them or you can make them yourself, do it yourself. Make sure that they're standardized so that you can switch equipment from one hive to another. The condition of a hive, I like to talk about Motel 6 or Hilton's. You don't, bees don't need to live in a Hilton. Your hive can be old and, and sort of ratty. You can, re, you can repair it and replace it when it falls apart, but they don't need much more than a Motel 6. Uh, be careful about contamination. AFB is that American fowl brood that I talked about. Where to get bees, pros and cons. Uh, swarm traps, swarms or traps. You can, you can get traps and put them. You can make traps very simple. Uh, real quickly, I like to think of a swarm 
as like a bunch of middle or older age people who know each other, have a few tools, are going on a bus somewhere to start a new life together. That's what a swarm is. In our terms, a package are like people who have been ripped from their homes, don't know each other, are from all walks of life, were thrown onto a Greyhound bus, not knowing where they're going, and then they decide to start a commune. Nukes, and I told you I'd tell you what that meant. A nuke is a nucleus of a hive. It has nothing to do with nuclear energy. It's a nucleus of a hive. So it's usually four or five frames of bees with all ages of brood and at least two frames with nectar and pollen. So it's basically a small colony. Dukes are like, like a small but equipped group of people of all ages going together on a Greyhound bus with all their tools and baggage to build a new life. And when I say baggage, they could have baggage like uh, mites or diseases. Be careful there. Whole colonies are another way you can go with a whole colony. It's just the whole colony. And I've, I've bought whole colonies uh, where I was able to split it or make five nukes out of it immediately. So sometimes that's a good deal, but you need to have it inspected or be able to inspect it to make sure you're not buying problems, just like a car. So they all have pros and cons. Once you have bees, it's not difficult to increase the number of your colonies because you can make splits or nukes or divisions or artificial swarms, they're all the same thing. That's fairly easy to do in the springtime. That the swarming season is in the spring and it can be used as a way of make, splitting colonies or making nukes can be used as a way of dissuading swarming. But remember, when you're increasing the number of colonies, you're taking one strong colony that would make more honey than two or three weaker ones. So a strong colony is always going to make more honey. Catching a swarm is usually easy. You have to be prepared, have the equipment, getting to the swarm. Hopefully it's not up too high. Dropping the swarm, just shaking it to fall into a box. You don't need to find the queen. You just need to know that you have her and the bees will tell you and then keeping the swarm if you have another colony, if you give them one frame of brood, it's like locking the door. If you don't, there's a chance that they're gonna just leave the box you gave them. So it's easy if it is. Swarms are a natural uh, phenomena. It's a division. Our Western bees usually just swarm one time a year, but some more, it's a genetic trait. Some people raising queens or making divisions that do it when they're gonna swarm, when there's a lot of queen cells, those are swarm cells. So the bees have a tendency for swarming. The more you use those swarm cells, the more you're genetically selecting for swarming. So the more swarms you're gonna end up having. Swarming usually happens in the springtime. Scouts go out and look for a place, workers in the hive slow down, I told you all that. Uh, I told you all that. Where to put the bees? This was one of the questions I got in advance. Uh, since the evasion of the small hive beetles, bees hives should be put in the sun. Throughout the season, it's best that the hives are facing the south by southeast to get as much sun into the front of the hive as possible and as early as possible. It's always good to have some sort of wind blockage. They need to have fresh water nearby. If you don't have any fresh water, uh, something dripping, uh, I've suggested to people that they wrap a towel around a faucet and just have it barely dripping and the bees will drink off that towel. Uh, if you have neighbors, there should be a barrier to force the bees to fly high near the neighbors. Hives should be easy for you to access for working them and for harvesting. Part two of where to put them. In nature, bees often don't nest close to each other, but beekeepers often put them nearly touching. So beekeepers need to balance the two. They need to do their best, do the best separated by, bees do their best several yards, but it's less convenient for working with them. So I put mine usually a couple feet apart. This 
is answering another question I had, how many bees can I have in an area? Um, and can you saturate an area with too many colonies? So first of all, bees don't know property lines. Don't worry about the size of your lot. They don't care where your fence is. They're going to go over it. It said that bees will fly up to three miles for resources. We actually know that they fly farther. At 15 miles an hour, bees can go three miles in 12 minutes. They'll go a shorter distance if they can find resources shorter because bees will save time and energy if they can find resources closer. So here's a beehive sitting in the middle of wherever it is. And around it, I've put a radius of a half a mile. If bees can find a radius, their, their sources within a half a mile, they're covering 502 acres with a half a mile radius. So that's not flying very far and they're covering 500 acres. That takes them two minutes to go anywhere in that, in that area. If you go, if they have to go a full mile, they're covering 2,000 acres. It takes them four minutes to go anywhere in that 2,000 acres. If they have to go two miles, they're covering 8,000 acres. It'll take them eight minutes to go anywhere in that, in that 8,000 acres. And if they went the three, the full three miles, they'd be covering 18,000 acres. So I don't worry too much about oversaturating an area unless there's hundreds and hundreds of hives there. They're going to find food. How to inspect colonies. It's easier to inspect and judge needs and or problems if you have more than one colony by comparison. If you have one colony, you don't know if it's doing well or not. If you don't if you don't have to find the queen, you just need to look for proof that she's doing her job. So look for brood. If you find the queen, it's always fun to find the queen. But if she's doing her job, you know she's there. Always light a smoker in case you need it. With time, reading the frames becomes easier. So you, you are able to look at the frames and know what's going on in the colony, know what they need, know what problems they have in that that just grows with time. Always look for diseases and parasites and measure the level of any problems to decide what you should do about it. Keep good notes. Just a couple pictures. This is in Nepal. These are a different breed of bees and they're in the kitchen of this Nepali house uh, in the wall. They put them there so they have easy access to honey. They're not very productive, but it was interesting. This is the way I like to teach. This is, I don't remember where this is. It's in Africa, I know, because I'm dressed up. <laughs> um, I think it was probably in Ethiopia. This is uh, the next the last slide that I'm going to show you. But in my teaching, this is back in Nepal again. Uh, we try to have some fun. So I hid some honey out in the woods in the jungle and split the group into, into colonies, if you will. And one of them was a scout. I showed him where the honey was and he had to come back and dance, the bee dance to show the rest of his colony where the honey was. They had fun, they got into it with drums and everything. <laughs> so that brings us to questions and answers and I'm already 48 or 30, 18 minutes over, 20 minutes over. So I don't know what you want to do. Um, no, it's quite all right. I mean, everyone really wanted you to finish the presentation. Ed. Um, everyone seemed to have really enjoyed it. Uh, since we are over time, I'll just give you a few questions and then uh, try to follow up on the ones we're not able to answer okay, uh, let me, today. Let me, say, let me say this real quick. I've created a, a email address, abworkshop. 2020 at gmail.com. You can send questions to me. Don't overburden me with too many. I'm going to leave that email open for two weeks and then I'm having surgery and it's going to be closing down. So uh, send me questions if you have. I'm sorry, Luke, go on. No, you're, no, you're great. I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, okay, so one question we got from Trey. If you want to move your hive, can you force them to reorient? to a new location? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. If you 
if you want to or need to move your hive, if you move it more than three miles, they'll usually reorient automatically. Um, so that's usually not a problem. Now, most beekeepers will tell you, you have to move it at least three miles. And I've learned otherwise that you can move it a short distance. You can move it real short distances, a little at a time to get it to where you want it to be. If you move it a yard or two yards, the bees are gonna go back to where they thought they were naturally. But if you move it in the evening and then face it a different direction, make it look really different by piling a bunch of stuff in front of it so that they have to work to get out, then they'll, they'll think they're in a different place. And after a few days of them working their way through the weeds and branches that you've put in front of them, then you can take that away and, and make it neat again. So that will usually work. Doing that, it's not a bad idea to put a white box where it used to be because you'll catch some for the next few days there and you can just take them and dump them back in the hive a few times. Okay. Great, thank you. One more question. Uh, this is from Milton. If a hive fails, what part can be used to start a new hive in the next spring with a nuke? And what do you have to do to them? The hive fails, okay. First of all, you need to decide why it failed. Um, so if it failed because it didn't have enough food, you can do, you can use it right away. If they failed because they lost their queen, same thing. Uh, it's best if you see a colony that's failing to figure out why it's failing and do whatever you can to save them or combine them with another colony by putting newspaper between them and slitting the newspaper and, uh, so that they, the newspaper acts like a fuse that they work their way through and become accustomed to each other and smell all the same after a while. Did that answer the question? I think so. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, I'm gonna do just one more question here. Um, so this one was from Michael. He said, how do you prevent foul brood? He said, that is a threat that keeps him from attempting beekeeping. How do you how do you do what with foul brood? Prevent foul okay. brood. Okay, um, foul brood is a bacteria that kills the larvae at a certain age. If you have a colony that doesn't have foul brood, as long as there isn't any foul brood very close by, you shouldn't get it. It won't happen. Uh, we used to treat uh, against foul brood prophylactically by giving them antibiotics on a regular basis. And that has been proven bad practice. In fact, the antibiotics don't cure foul brood if you have it. So uh, the main thing is just make sure your equipment is clean, make sure your tools are clean. Uh, if you're visiting somebody else's hive, make sure that they don't have foul brood or if they do make sure you clean everything before you go back to your own and you shouldn't get foul brood. It's not as common as it used to be. Now there's two different types of foul brood. There's American foul brood, which didn't start in America, started before America. <laughs> um, and there's European foul brood. European foul brood is not as contagious as American foul brood. American foul brood, basically it's best just to burn everything and it's required in most states. Okay. Well, th thank you so much, Ed, for taking the time to, to give this presentation. Looking at the comments, people really got a lot out of this. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, for more webinars like this, more resources like this, you can visit our website. And happy beekeeping. Thank you all for joining us.